Thank you. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, cervical disc arthroplasty. All right. So, as we outlined, uh, I'm going to go over some of the anatomy of the spine, uh, as well as discuss some of the common cervical pathology that we encounter here. Um, from there, I'm going to talk about the background of disc arthroplasty. Um, discuss its origins and spend some time discussing the various implant, implant designs and how they've evolved over the past three decades. Uh, finally, I'll go over some of the indications for disc replacement, discuss the outcomes of various types of surgeries, and then review some of the complications and go over a few case presentations. Uh, so starting with a brief review of the cervical spine anatomy, uh, as we know, there are seven cervical vertebrae with eight corresponding spinal nerves. Uh, the cervical spine serves to orient the head in space and allows for significant motion in multiple axes, including flexion, extension, lateral bending, and axial rotation. Uh, from C3 to T1, there are four main joints between each cervical vertebrae. Uh, there are two posterior set joints and then two uncovertebral joints, which are located on the posterior axis of the vertebral body. Uh, the uncovertebral joints are significant when doing anterior procedures as they, do, they mark the lateral borders of the vertebral body. Um, going lateral to the uncle vertebral joints, you'll encounter the vertebral artery, which usually runs um, in the transverse brain. Uh, between each cervical vertebrae is an intervertebral disc. Uh, these disc spaces consist of a cartilaginous end plate um, between the superior and inferior vertebrae, as well as the central nucleus pulposus and a peripheral annulus fibrosis. Uh, the nucleus pulposus consists of a proteoglycan water matrix. Um, which is held together by type 2 collagen and elastin fibers. Uh, these proteoglycans have numerous highly anionic uh, glycosaminoglycan side chains, um, things like aggregan, chondroitin sulfate, keratin sulfate. Um, these all attract water. And then this composition allows the disc to collect and release water molecules when responding to compressive stresses. The annulus fibrosis, which peripherally surrounds this, is composed of about 20 concentric rings of highly organized collagen fibers, mainly type 1 collagen. Uh, the annulus has tensile properties, uh, which act to contain the nucleus pulposus and then also help it recover its original shape after uh, compression. As we know, discs na naturally degenerate with age. Uh, this has to do with changes in the water content as well as end plate permeability. Um, all these change over time. Um, but you know, the exact mechanism for degenerative disc disease and how this causes pain in patients is still being more fully understood on a molecular level. Uh, it's clear that uh, cyclical mechanical loading over time can lead to micro fractures in the end plates and then end plate changes. Um, this changes the metabolic processes that surround the discs. Um, these changes, along with changes of natural aging, um, ultimately lead to disc degeneration and then a decrease in disc height. When you get a decrease in disc height, um, you get uh, the anterior column of the spine then starts to fail and you have more, more stress is placed on the posterior column of the spine. Uh, this leads to you know, corresponding new bone formation um, in the form of osteophytes. You get facet hypertrophy and eventual spondylosis. Cervical spondylosis, like joint arthritis, becomes a problem when patients become symptomatic. Uh, one presenting condition that was thoroughly talked about by Dr. Selmach in a recent Grand Rounds was cervical myelopathy. Cervical myelopathy is caused by compression of the cervical spinal cord due to degenerative changes. Common presenting symptoms include upper extremity paresthesias. Uh, these are usually in a non dermatomal pattern. Um, patients often sometimes report some clumsiness. Uh, they might have decreased manual dexterity, as well as gait or balance abnormalities. Um, while some patients have neck pain, about 15% of patients with severe myelopathy do not report any neck pain, and this can make making the diagnosis a little bit more difficult. Finally, in severe cases of myelopathy, um, urinary retention can be a later manifestation. Radiographic changes seen on MRI include degenerative changes to the facet joints and the uncovertebral joints. You might see disc osteophytes, and then importantly, you, you'll usually see a decreased sagittal diameter of the spinal canal with associated uh, compression of the spinal cord. Cervical radiculopathy is a clinical condition characterized by unilateral arm pain, um, numbness, or paresthesias. These usually follow a more dermatomal distribution. And then you sometimes have weakness in corresponding muscle groups. Most common causes for radiculopathy are herniated discs. However, cervical spondylosis and disc degeneration that leads to any neuroforaminal compression 
or any other form of compression in the foramen can cause um, symptoms of radiculopathy. As a reminder, in cervical spine, nerve roots exit at the level of the course um, at the level of the corresponding vertebrae. So a disc herniation at C3, C4 will usually affect the C4 exiting nerve root. So this picture from Miller's is just a helpful review of the specific physical exam findings that may correspond to nerve compression or radiculopathy. Um, it's important to be able to use your physical exam to try and correlate symptomatology with the patient's underlying spinal pathophysiology, as there can be other downstream causes for radicular pain. Um, if you know, there's any confusion, an EMG and nerve conduction studies can be utilized to help um, narrow your differential between a central or peripheral nerve compression. And then the treatment for the majority of patients um, who present with symptoms of cervical radiculopathy is usually non-operative treatment. Um, usually rest, activity, um, modification, uh, therapy, or oral steroids can lead to a resolution of symptoms in as many as 83% of patients. Normally, most patients see acute improvement within four to six months. However, complete resolution can take a significant amount of time, um, sometimes occurring um, between 24 and 36 months. Uh, selective foraminal steroid injections or epidural steroid injections are a more minimally invasive procedure um, that has been shown to provide long-term relief in as many as 60% of cases. However, about 25% of patients have symptoms that are refractory to all these conservative measures, and ultimately they opt for surgical management. Uh, the workhorse for most of these procedures is the ACDF or the anterior cervical disc fusion. However, other options include the anti an anterior posterior foraminotomy, as well as cervical disc arthroplasty, which is what I'm going to spend the remainder of my talk you know, discussing. So the first disc replacement uh, devices were developed for the lumbar spine um, and were uh, not actually developed for the cervical spine. Um, they were described in the literature by Fernstrom in 1966. Uh, he actually implanted these devices in the lumbar spine as well as the cervical spine. However, at that time, ACDF was a well-established and accepted technique for treating cervical spondylosis, and thus there wasn't much of an adoption of the technique until the 1980s. In 1980, um, there was a study published by Bronstein where he first reported the correlation of radiographic adjacent segment degeneration and spondylosis following um, cervical fusion. This finding led to an understanding that surgically fusing a segment can increase the rigidity of the spine and then change the normal kinematics, and therefore you can get this adjacent segment degeneration. Uh, to prevent this, the idea of disc replacement was re-explored um, with the goal of trying to preserve motion at the operative segment. And then the first design prosthesis for the cervical spine was developed by Brian Cummins in uh, the late 80s. Uh, this implant was st a stainless steel metal ball, which was placed into a stainless steel socket device as pictured here. In his initial experience, Cummins reported on 22 implants patient placed in 20 patients over a six-year period. Um, his results had numerous complications. Um, they had screw pullout, failure of symptom resolution. Uh, there was a case of hemiparesis. Um, as seen on the x-ray on the right, the anterior profile of the implant was quite prominent. Um, this led to significant post-operative dysphagia. Um, and ultimately, you know, uh, this implant itself wasn't adopted across, uh, you know, the, the, across spine, but uh, he did report that there was preservation of motion at the operative segment, and his conclusion was that implanting an artificial, artificial disc was a feasible option in order to preserve motion in the cervical spine. So since that first Cummins implant, um, there has been significant advancement in technology. Um, in 2006, uh, Sears first described the classification for cervical disc implants. He discussed, discussed an implant's kinematic degrees of freedom with respect to its motion. So he described that a native disc has six degrees of freedom um, and that it can have motion in six different planes. There are three degrees of freedom in the angular plane, which we describe as flexion and extension, lateral bending and axial rotation. And then there are three degrees of freedom in a translational plane. So we describe those as anterior and posterior translation, lateral translation, as well as vertical translation or compression of the inner vertebral discs. So this last component is the most challenging one to replicate in a disc replacement device as you have to have some sort of material that can cause compression. Sears also described implants based on a type of constraint that they possess. So constraint in cervical prosthesis refers to limitations in the degrees of, of freedom that a device has in three-dimensional space. 
So from a kinematic standpoint, a device is said to be unconstrained if it has no limits on its degrees of freedom and therefore can move independently in almost all planes of motion. So all six planes of motion. When a degree of freedom is taken away, a component is set, then said to be constrained. Um, most implants on the market have a semi-constrained design um, where they don't have a full six degrees of, of freedom, um, but they are constrained in one or more planes of motion. Uh, what's important is to distinguish constraint from limitations in range of motion. Um, you know, there is no physiologic block to motion in these devices. A constrained implant simply just can't move in that plane of motion. So it, it doesn't have the ability to anteriorly translate or posterior translate. It just doesn't have that, um, that mobility. Um, another important concept when planning a cervical disc replacement is implant positioning. Uh, to understand proper positioning, we need to understand how motion occurs in the spine. Uh, a functional spinal unit consists of the superior and inferior vertebrae and the joints between them. For each spinal unit, there is a unique instantaneous center of rotation, which can be calculated at any position of flexion extension or lateral bending. And we usually use flexion extension films to help us judge the average center of rotation in the sagittal plane. Uh, this position seen on the upper right image is normally more posterior and caught at in the upper cervical spine and then closer to the inferior end plate in the lower cervical spine. The center of rotation for lateral bending in the coronal plane is normally centered in the superior vertebral body. Now, this becomes important when we think about the nuances of implant design. For example, when looking at a ball and socket type prosthesis, the radius of curvature of the ball can affect the motion of that segment. A ball that has a larger radius of curvature uh, can inferiorly translate the center of rotation and lead to more anterior translation when in forward flexion. This may be greater than physiologic motion, so it's important to kind of understand that. Uh, it's important to realize that also this anterior translation is not true translation. Um, a ball and socket joint only has three degrees of freedom. It only has flexion, extension, lateral bending, and axial rotation. And so this anterior translation is more of a pseudo translation. It doesn't, uh, it's not actually causing the uh, implant to actually slide forward, which you'll see in you know, other implants. And then similarly in the coronal plane, it's important to understand the center, with the center of rotation in the superior vertebrae, if you're utilizing that same ball and socket joint, you actually move that center of rotation inferiorly into the inferior vertebrae, which is in no way physiologic. When this happens, you can get non-physiologic motions. Um, this, these can result in impingement. So if you look on, on the left side, you can see that normally in the superior vertebrae, the uncle vertebral processes clear each other. However, when you move that center of rotation down to the inferior vertebrae, you get unsinate process contact, which can ultimately lead to further degeneration, um, unsinate spurring, and then pain. So, you know, when designing these implants, it's imp important to think about the nuances of implant positioning, um, as well as, uh, um, you know, discussing that when you're thinking about bringing them to market. Uh, the initial implants were usually two component designs and thus had one joint for articulation. Um, however, just because there's one joint, that doesn't mean that they only have one degree of freedom. That depends on the type of bearing surface. So for example, a saddle type prosthesis um, is said to have two degrees of freedom. It can achieve motion and flexion and extension as well as lateral bending. Like I said before, a ball and socket prosthesis like the ProDisc C, or the Discover implant has three degrees of freedom. It allows motion in all the angular planes. And then an implant like that's a ball and trot or a non-congruent ball and socket has four degrees of freedom. Uh, the lack of conformity between the two, uh, you know, the two implants allows for some translation in sagittal plane, along with those three angular movements of flexion extension, lateral bending, and axial rotation. Three component designs allow for two articulating joints. Um, in these designs, there is normally a mobile core that then articulates with the superior and inferior implants, which are then fixated to the end plates. By adding this middle component, there are two joints where motion can occur, and thus there's an increase in the potential degree of freedom. One such implant, the Movie C, has five degrees of freedom. There are three angular planes of motion. However, the core itself can also translate 1.25 millimeters in the sagittal and coronal planes, allowing for independent translation. The secure C has a ball and socket joint at superior articulation, which allows for three degrees of freedom. And then as inferior um, articulation, it has a cylindrical joint, which can allow for anterior and um, posterior translation. Therefore, it has four degrees of freedom. Finally, a more um, 
more recent type of implant design is the non-articulating prosthesis. Um, in these implants, there is no articulating component. Um, and most of these have actually six degrees of freedom. Instead of the articulating components, the core is replaced by a compliant material like a polycarbonate polyurethane. Um, this is supposed to mimic the nucleus pulposus. Uh, the material can allow for compression in the superior and inferior plane, as well as anterior and translational motion in all other planes. These processes do, uh, do allow for, uh, they have some inherent uh, restraint to motion. Um, so this resistance is dependent on the stiffness um, of the prosthesis. And then while these aren't really constrained, you know, this is um, what we describe more restraint on motion. So it's not an actual constraint in their degrees of freedom. They're still able, to, still able to move, but this inherent stiffness causes some restraint in the amount of motion that can be achieved at that segment. So um, a standard for, you know, the normal surgical technique, uh, we usually util utilize a standard Smith-Robinson approach. Um, and this is performed for um, almost all cervical disc replacements. Uh, it's important to know your implants uh, fixation technique prior to, uh, you know, your surgery. Um, as, you know, if you have heels, you want to know where you're placing your cast bar pins. Um, cast bar pins are placed at the superior and inferior um, vertebrae in order to kind of jack open um, this space. But if you place them directly midline and the implant has a heel, you can affect the fixation technique for that implant um, when you're putting that implant in. Um, for patients who have significant spondylosis, it's very important to perform a uh, full discectomy and decompression. Um, many authors report performing a more thorough uh, foraminal decompression than they, may perform, than they may typically perform for an ACDF, and that's to prevent any recurrence at that disc space. Removal of the posterior longitudinal ligament um, has been a topic that has been deba debated. Um, a more complete resection or partial, partial resection allows for more thorough decompression. Um, and then when studied, McAfee found uh, no changes in angular range of motion um, with or without uh, PLL resection and then no instability. Finally, uh, end plate fixation varies, like I said, based on the, the type of uh, fixation mechanism, but it's important to limit the amount of end plate preparation. So um, normally you just want to take the cartilaginous portion of the end plate. Um, if you have significant bony bleeding or you take a significant amount of bone, you can actually change the, where you want your center of rotation to be. On top of that, significant bony bleeding can lead to heterotopic bone formation and ultimate fusion of that disc space. So getting all these things right, um, having the appropriate implant, um, proper implant positioning, proper fixation, um, what exactly are the results? Uh, when, which patients are indicated for disc replacement? And when is this a better option in ACDF? So the initial FDA trials for disc arthroplasty um, started in 2004. Uh, these were prospective and randomized trials. Um, their initial indications included patients who were 18 to 65 years old. They had symptoms of radiculopathy or myelopathy, um, an absence of advanced spondylosis. And then they were unresponsive. They had to be unresponsive to conservative therapy for at least six weeks. Patients had, um, they couldn't have any underlying bone disease in terms of um, cancer, osteoporosis. And then they were randomized either to, uh, uh, you know, anterior cervical diffusion or total disc replacement. Most of these trials started with single level replacements, but over time, uh, a couple expanded to dual level disc replacements or were initially set up for dual level disc replacements. These are the randomized trials that have been conducted over the last decade. Um, there is also one that's missing, which is the M6C, um, which is a more uh, newer non-articulating um, artificial disc that was developed by Orthofix. Uh, all these implants have been considered to have overall success if their two-year data ex exceeded or was proven to be non-inferior to anterior fusion. Uh, this overall success included neck pain and disability scores, um, complications related to the device or surgery, need for additional surgeries, and or changes in neurologic symptoms. Since these trials, the indications have somewhat stayed the same in the United States. Um, there are some absolute contraindications to disc replacement. Uh, those include uh, patients who have advanced spinal deformity, um, those who only have isolated axial neck pain, um, patients who have significant immobile segments, or like those with uh, DISH or significant OPLL, um, anyone with a significant instability in the cervical spine, or significant facet joint degeneration or fusion or, or any infection. There are a couple, obviously, relative contraindications um, that would mainly impact the bone implant interface and could lead to implant subsidence. So 
you know, like I've discussed, there's numerous different implants. Um, I chose to do a dive deeper mainly on the Moby C implant. Um, this is an implant that's used by Dr. Chiapetta, the one I've been familiar, more familiar with here. Um, but as I'll point out later, the majority of all these of the performance data and outcome data for all these implants is pretty consistent across all of, all of the implants. So the initial um, FDA trial for the Moby C was a was designed for a two level disc replacement uh, compared to a two level ACDF. They had 330 total patients. Um, there are 225 that were randomized, uh, or there are 225 that were in the Moby C cohort, and then 105 randomized to the ACDF cohort. Um, when evaluating overall success, um, which was, like I said, classified based off of improvement in neck and disability scores, lack of complications, as well as uh, decreased reoperation rates, uh, the Moby C cohort had 69% success rate compared to a 37% success rate for the ACDF at 24 months. The disc replacement group had significant improvements in NDI scores as well as VAS neck pain scores. And then the reoperation rate was 3.1% for the, this arthroplasty group compared to 11% for the fusion group. Additionally, there were no differences in the rate, rates of serious adverse events between the two groups. This, can, this data continues to pan out at four years. Um, patients who had disc replacement continue to have better NDI scores, they have better SF12 scores and they had better patient outcome scores and a higher rate of overall success compared to ACDF. When looking at range of motion, the patient's post-operative range of motion at the index level has been maintained um, at 48 months. And then subsequent surgery rates for operations at adjacent levels continues to remain low at 4% compared to 15.2% for effusion, um, signifying lower adjacent segment degeneration. Finally, this, I mean, this study here looks at you know, single level outcomes in the MOBC. So the initial FDA trial is for two levels. Um, looking at five years, they included, uh, they found that the, the ACDF was, or the disc replacement was considered non inferior to, compared to fusion. So the overall success rate was 61.9% in the arthroplasty group, and then 52.2% in the fusion group. Uh, they, did, they did continue to find that the uh, rate of subsequent surgery was lower in the disc replacement cohort at 4.9% compared to 17.3%, which was significant. And then there were significant improvements in all outcome measures in both cohorts over time. In their study, they also found that the range of motion at the operative level for the disc replacement group um, remained the same in all post-operative time points. Um, furthermore, uh, there was significant reduction in uh, radiogra radiographic adjacent segment degeneration in the disc replacement group compared to the ACDF cohort. Uh, so at the inferior adjacent segment, this was uh, significantly reduced at all time at all time points, and then the superior uh, adjacent segment, this was um, significantly reduced at four at the four and five year mark. Now, there's even more data out on the MOBC trials recently. The seven year data from uh, the FDA trials came out, and then there's ten year data that was also reported from a different study. Um, these results are continue to be consistent. Um, there are uh, the arthroplasty group continues to have better overall success scores. They have a more significant improvement in NDI scores, and they have um, uh, better patient satisfaction than the ACDF cohort. Um, there remains to be a, a there remains a significantly lower rate of reoperation in the cervical disc replacement group, which I think is probably the most important measure as you're trying to prevent that adjacent segment degeneration. So I mentioned that these results are not just isolated to the Moby C prostheses. Um, this is a, a graph that basically of all the other FDA IDE trials, it's a little bit hard to read, but um, basically you know, they all follow a similar trajectory. So the mean NDI scores for all other implants continues to decrease over time um, after um, uh, this replacement. And this is, this is in a two year data. And then, um, you know, there have been a couple of studies that have looked at the rates of radiographic adjacent level disc degeneration. Um, these were all read by an independent observer, so it's not associated with the FDA trials. Um, and they found that, you know, the, uh, in other discs, the rates of uh, adjacent level degeneration was uh, significantly lower compared to ACDF. So for the Brian disc, that was about 12.8%. Um, for the Kineflex um, C, that's about 10.1%. Uh, um, and then for the Moby C, I'm looking at single level and dual level, um, you know, it was 27% uh, and 14% compared to 47 and 49% to the ACDF cohort, all these being significant. Finally, um, cumulative rates of secondary surgery were lower across the board. 
Um, Seven-year outcome data shows that the rates of uh, uh, cumulative secondary surgery remain in single digits for the disc replacement group compared to the ACDF cohort. Um, with uh, and, and so you know that's obviously significant as well. So um, the Moby C, this is one of the uh, newer articulating discs um, that just came to market in I think 2020. Um, they have a polyurethane core um, and it had six degrees of freedom. Uh, so they just uh, published their two-year outcome data in February. Uh, they tested their disc in 152 patients and matched that to 164 patients who underwent ACDF. In their comparison, they demonstrated non-inferiority. So um, there were no differences in supplemental surgical interventions. Um, the NDI score changes and the rates of serious adverse events um, or neurological improvements were very similar. Uh, the implant did demonstrate significant improvements in VAS neck pain scores and arm pain scores at two years when compared to ACDF. And then interestingly, they also commented on uh, chronic opioid use at two years and found that uh, patients who underwent this arthroplasty um, at, two, at the two-year point were using less chronic opioids than patients who uh, underwent anterior fusion. This hasn't really been looked at in many of the other studies. So What's the answer for patients who present like this with multi-level findings? Um, you know, degenerative disc disease at C5-6 as well as C6-7. Um, and then, you know, these patients aren't necessarily perfect candidates for a disc replacement procedure, but fusing multiple levels also has increased risks such as pseudoarthrosis as well as higher rates, um, as I stated, for adjacent segment degeneration. So uh, hybrid techniques involving both fusion and arthroplasty have been increased, increasingly, increasingly reported in the literature. Um, reportedly, about 5% of the spine um, pop patient population presenting with neck pain have multi-level degenerative disease. Uh, normally, these patients um, are undergoing multiple levels of anterior fusion. Um, however, like I said, this, this results in decreased neck range of motion. Um, there's a higher rate of pseudoarthrosis, as well as higher rates of adjacent segment pathology um, down the line. So to prevent this, um, more surgeons are going to some sort of hybrid procedure. Um, where if a patient has significant facet disease at one level and then adjacent disc disease at another level, they're going to be a combination of, a, of an anterior fusion and a disc replacement. Outcomes from these studies are also good. Um, this is a study published uh, in 2020 in the International Spine Journal. They had 151 patients with multi-level disease, um, and they were treated with some combination of fusion and disc replacement. Uh, they found that the clinical outcomes of the hybrid procedures were comparable to those of just um, you know, multi-level fusions. They had significantly decreased VAS neck pain and arm pain scores, as well as decreased NDI scores and excellent satisfaction at their two-year time point outcomes. Um, proponents for hybrid techniques advocate for that pres preserved physiologic range of motion rather than, um, you know, multi-level fusion. Uh, other studies have reported that range of motion um, is, uh, is similarly preserved with these hybrid procedures. And there are a few, if any, differences in complications and then serious adverse events between the hybrid surgery and multi-level fusion. In general, though, the research describing hybrid surgery is in its early stage. Um, they need more long-term and randomized uh, level one studies or need to better understand how it compares to multi-level fusion. So the last outcomes article I wanted to go over was a meta-analysis comparing um, SF36 scores between disc replacement and total joint arthroplasty. Uh, joint arthroplasty procedures, you know, hip replacements and knee replacements, as we see, they're considered to be some of the best orthopedic procedures that we have. Uh, this study by Anderson um, compared SF36 scores, which has a physical and a mental component, um, compared to disc replacement. Uh, they found that, uh, you know, the uh, physical um, score of the SF36 had significantly greater improvement in disc arthroplasty compared to either fusion, hip replacement, and knee replacement. And they also found that um, neck procedures had uh, you know, both fusion and disc replacement were significantly, uh, had a significant higher improvement in um, mental scores of the SF36 compared to hip and knee replacement as well. So, you know, this, this study only compared, they compared, you know, two uh, randomized controlled trials of disc replacement compared to 18 studies of hip and knee replacement. So I think you need to a little bit have more robust disc replacement um, data. However, it, it is promising that disc replacement surgery has a lot of potential. So, you know, outcome conclusions, um, you, know, you know, the major conclusions from this is that disc replacement has demonstrated a significant reduction in radiographic adjacent segments of degeneration, as well as a significant reduction in secondary surgery at the index level. 
This replacement for the most part has comparable or superior outcome scores as compared to ACDF, um, and they preserve segmental range of motion at that operative level. Um, but nothing kills confidence like follow-up. And so, um, you know, going through the literature and looking at complications, uh, this is the largest meta-analysis looking at disc replacement complications in comparison to anterior fusion. Uh, they found very little differences between, between the two procedures. Uh, there was a slight increase in operative time in a disc replacement cohort, and there was also um, a lower relative risk of serious adverse events um, in the disc replacement cohort, um, like dural tear, arterial injury, or neurologic compromise compared to ACDF. They also looked at all prior meta-analyses looking at complications. Um, the blue boxes are the only areas where ACDF was found to be superior. Uh, the red boxes are where this arthroplasty was superior, and the yellow boxes are where there really wasn't any difference. So um, this might also be a little bit tough to see, but the only areas where ACDF was found to be superior was in, was in operative times and blood loss, as I mentioned previously, and um, that was only found in three, three studies. So when looking more specifically at the serious adverse events, um, uh, this is another large meta-analysis that compared 29 studies. Eight of these were the FDA IDE studies, and they found that the rates of dysphagia, dysphonia, vascular compromise, and then cervical wound infection and CSF leak were all relatively low and comparable to the rates of ACDF procedures currently um, in the literature. The only main complication that's increased, increasingly reported um, compared to ACDF is the rates of heterotopic ossification, which makes sense because in an anterior fusion, you want new bone to form there versus the disc replacement, you don't. Um, McAfee and Marin described the classification system for HO. Um, they graded HO into five stages. Um, grade zero, there is no HO present. Um, grade one and two HO, uh, in grade one and two, there is evidence of heterotopic ossification, but this is unlikely to be compromising any function of the prosthesis. And then in grade three grade, and grade four, the HO has bridged or fused and should impact range of motion at that segment. Uh, a systematic review looking at the rates of HO and disc replacement found that the pool of prevalence of heterotopic ossification is about 32% of, of arthroplasty procedures. They found that the rate of HO goes up linearly, linearly with time, and that at, at about six years, 45% of patients who undergo a disc replacement so, do have some form of heterotopic ossification. They found that the rates of HO to be higher um, utilizing certain implants. So, for example, the Kineflex C and Secure C have higher rates of HO, but they don't go into much detail um, regarding the reasoning for this. Um, looking at both of those implants, they both are peeled implants. So I'm a little curious if that has to do with um, just more aggressive end plate preparation, leading to more bony bleeding and therefore you know, a possible uh, increased rates of HO. However, more importantly, when classifying HO into any form that limits range of motion, so grades two, three, or four, they found that the pool prevalence uh, decreases to about 11%. So signifying that while there is some radiographic evidence of heterotopic ossification, most of these cases shouldn't prevent any functional range of motion in that segment. Finally, um, you know, is disc replacement cost effective? Uh, McEnany published two papers outlining a cost analysis for disc replacement for both single and double level disease. He stated that um, using a willingness to pay a $50,000 um, which is usually the recommended baseline. Uh, single level disc replacement would be cost effective at seven years, and this would be chosen about 56% of the time. For two level um, disc replacement, he found that um, you know you have to use a willingness to pay of 100,000, and then using that disc replacement would be chosen 61% of the time um, at you know at a five year time point. So um, a more recent review of this cost analysis uh, was done in, in 2020, um, published in the World of Neurosurgery. Uh, they advocate for longer term um, uh, data. Um, they do state that currently it's you know, proven to be cost effective at the five and seven year time point. However, they wanna see you know, what are the rebates of revision surgery you know, at 15, 20 years and does that continue to make these implants cost effective? So um, they advocate for a longer um, um, longer outlook. So um, in general, uh, disc replacement has superior short-term data to support improved outcome scores, improved range of motion, and then similar complication rates compared to ACDF. Um, this is both for single and double level disease. 
It's important to understand the proper indications um, for when to use disc replacement and be aware of the various implants on the market and how then to best utilize them for optimal results. Uh, while there is a wealth of level one uh, research that's being done in this field, uh, further research on different implant designs, as well as some of the hybrid fusion and replacement constructs uh, will help progress, will help progress this field in the future. So moving on to some case presentations. Um, first case is the patient CA. Uh, she's a 15 year old female, has a chief complaint of neck pain that began following a motor vehicle collision in 2018. Um, in that collision, she was a restrained front seat passenger. Uh, she has previously been treated with anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, as well as a cervical steroid injection um, without any relief of symptoms. Her pain is primarily posterior neck pain that then radiates through her upper and mid trapezius muscles and then into the right arm. She doesn't have any real significant past medical issues. On her physical exam, um, you know, she has a notably a little bit of decreased tricep strength, and then she has a positive Sperling's test on the left. However, her sensation is mostly intact. This is an MRI, this is a sagittal MRI, um, you know, and you can see a, you know, moderate sized disc osteophyte complex at C67. Um, looking at it a little bit closer on the axial scans, you can see that there is some central compression of the fecal sac. Um, there's also some foraminal narrowing um, on the right that could be compressing that right uh, C7 nerve root. Can you show us which image where, where the compression is? Yeah, sorry. I, I know it's hard to do that. So I was, I was considering having still images. So let's see. So you can see right here, this disc osteophyte complex posteriorly. Oh, sorry, I'm going to put the pointer up. It looks like a central disc not pressing on anything. Sorry, it's not working. Right. We've got a central disc here. Um, you know, I, I agree. This is a uh, mild to moderate. Um, you've got, I'm trying to read this eraser. Hold on. Sorry, it's not working very well. So you've got you know a disc bulge there on, um, and then you've got a little bit of a disc osteophyte complex. I would agree it's not significant, but you know the patient continued to have symptoms. Um, she tried physical therapy, she tried steroid injections, and that wasn't um, causing any benefit. Um, so and you know, as a relatively young patient, I think you know. Uh, obviously, failing conservative measures, you could, uh, you know, elect her for um, some sort of surgical procedure to remove that disc osteophyte complex, which is ultimately what she wanted to have done. Um, what, about, what about what about the all the other things you mentioned in the beginning, like a, a, a nerve root block or something to confirm that that was really the pathology? And how long after the accident in 2018 was a disc performed? So this was performed about. Uh, 10 months afterwards. Um, so this is performed, let me go back one slide here. She had an injection, right? Yeah, so she had injections. She had, you know, she had physical therapy. She had a cervical steroid injection, which did provide some basic relief initially, but did not provide long lasting relief of her symptoms. Um, and then, you know, because of that, uh, the decision was made to try to remove that disc osteophyte complex to hopefully provide longer lasting relief. So. You know, she did try those conservative measures for this ridiculous, these ridiculous symptoms. Um, and ultimately, you know, the decision was made to go for a cervical disc replacement um, for this patient, um, which she underwent a C67 disc replacement using a Moby C type device. Um, afterwards, um, you know, looking at her follow up, she did not have any recurrence of symptoms. Um, you know, she obviously had initial post surgical neck pain, but at her six month follow up visit, all her symptoms had resolved that she hasn't been seen back in the office. Um, since this procedure. Um, next case presentation, uh, this is a 47-year-old female. Um, she has a past medical history of hypertension and controlled diabetes. 
Uh, she presented due to uh, right arm radicular pain and paresthesias that acutely worsened you know, in the past seven days. Uh, she has a history of a prior C4, C5 disc arthroplasty that was performed in 2017. Um, and then, you know, three, she noticed that three months ago, she started having some intermittent numbness and paresthesias in her right arm. These symptoms got progressively worse three weeks ago. At that time, she went to an outside hospital. Um, she was given a Medrol dose pack and Valium. Um, since then, her symptoms have not improved. Um, and then at this time, she actually represented to the emergency department, um, endorsing some subjective weakness as well as radicular pain um, and then numbness in her right thumb and index finger. Um, she had denied any uh, fevers, any chills, any bowel or bladder incontinence, nothing concerning for any um, infection at that time. Um, on her physical exam, like I said, she had numbness primarily in a C5 distribution. She had some radicular symptoms on the right side, but the remainder of her exam, um, you know, she was uh, sensory motor intact. So this is her actual imaging from 2016, which I wanted to include here. This is prior to her C4-5 disc replacement. So in this patient, you can see, um, you know, on the sagittal, you can see some uh, degenerative disc disease at a couple different levels, um, C4, 5, as well as C6, 7. And going through her axial scans a little bit closer, I'll stop at the let's see, 2, 3, 3, 4. You can see there's a disc osteoply complex here. Sorry. With some compression possibly on the right side over here where the exiting nerve root would come out. And there's also, and then I also like to point out that there is some potential bulging of the um, C6, C7 disc um, that wasn't addressed at her index procedure as it wasn't causing any foraminal compression, but there is clearly a central disc bulge at C67 as well. So in C4, in 2017, she underwent a C4-5 disc replacement. She represented at about, you know, like I said, 2018 with those symptoms. Um, this is her MRI from that visit. You can see, uh, you know, disc herniation there on that far side below the segment, and then here on the axial image as well. The disc herniation over here, compressing that brain. So, you know, I, I, I'm curious because, you know, this one, obviously you've got some adjacent segment degeneration that occurred about only a year out, but I do think that she had some degeneration prior to her index procedure. I, you know, I wonder looking back, hindsight's always 2020, but would you consider doing a disc replacement at both levels? Um, you know, maybe. Um, she ended up undergoing uh, adjacent C6, C7 disc replacement. Um, and, you know, since then she's been doing well, but, you know, it's always common those debates whether how aggressive to be. Um, to treat somebody's symptoms and how um, and you know when you actually need to um, operate on multiple levels versus just operating on a single level. Why does it look like? Why does it look like at the C four five level that five was um, translated anteriorly compared to four, and why does C three four look like there's a spondy at that level as well? And even the right. level you did, it looks like the if you follow the posterior border of five and six, it looks like it's not lined up. You're saying between four and five and five and six, you're saying, you're saying, sorry, I'm moving my mouse over. You're saying- Well, the new, the new level doesn't seem to be lined up, but the discs seem to be not, uh, is that the way it's supposed to look? It so looks yeah, I, I did ask Dr. Chi ahead of that. So that's just the way that the discs are, ended up being, um, you know, uh, what they look radiographically. Uh, it doesn't actually have any effect to do with, um, you know, it, I guess the implant, um, as it fits there, that's the way it, it sometimes it can look. Um, I agree. I was curious as well as to whether or not that was abnormal, but I was sure that that's relatively normal. So the way it looks at the new level where the two pieces yep. of the implant look like they're perfectly sitting on each other, that's I normal. Was, and the one I, where it's a third off, that's normal too? I, 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 
this device is the, uh, the superior input uh, portion has a dome to it, and you try to get that dome to match the concavity uh, of the superior, if your input is superior vertical. Mm -hmm. That's not exactly where you would like it. Mm -hmm. uh, and where this one is sitting, you, if you go back to the procedure, the post op of the C45, yep. yeah, you can see that's exactly where it was placed on the superior one. The inferior uh, end plate device could be a little more posterior. But even on this one, you can see there's a slight anterior translocation. But these discs are designed to do that. And so depending on what position you take the x ray, it'll look like they will release a bit. And that's that uh, additional degree of motion. Yeah, that anterior that translation. Anterior translation that this is designed to do. Okay. If you go back now to the post op, which now got two devices, it looks like she's had some. Uh, polyethylene wear okay. because now the two uh, end plates are, are meeting posteriorly. What you see on the new procedure, the 5 6 level, is exactly what you would want to see, uh, which is uh, post office. You get a little bit of the anterior translation. It would you know, try to seek that posterior, uh, the superior uh, end plate piece a little more posterior to fit more closer to the dome. Uh, but depending on how accurate your x rays are and to see on this, uh, it, it's a better choice to back off if you think you're too close uh, posteriorly because you certainly don't want to see that where it kind of sub ups posteriorly. And with this procedure, you need to, uh, uh, I'm obligated to take the posterior ones to the right hand. No. Uh, and maybe that would happen. Well, the other thing is, I, you know, obviously I know, I was I talked about end plate preparation. Um, you know, it's harder with significant lower doses. I, I know just from recent learning about this, but it's harder to be able to access the disc space if you have significant lower doses and be able to get under that, you know, that uh, superior um, under that superior end plate just because of the positioning you're you are in the operating room. So it's harder to be able to clean that end plate out. So that could probably affect some of your seating of the implant. Um, the last case I'm just gonna go over is 56 year old female. Um, she had complaints of neck pain that began following a motorcycle accident in 2016. Uh, she reports the neck pain radiates to bilateral shoulders and her upper extremities. Um, reports some numbness and paresthesias of her bilateral upper extremities. Um, she's been unable to work due to her symptoms, and her uh, past medical history was significant for just uh, skin psoriasis, um, as well as some osteoarthritis um, of her hips. Uh, she, on physical exam, she has um, C6 and C7 numbness. Um, she did uh, have a already has already also undergone conservative measures. She had um, actually six months of physical therapy. Um, she did have uh, um, you know cervical injections. Um, which slightly improved, but did not cause long-lasting um, relief of some of her symptoms. Um, these are her x -ray, These are just general X-rays. Um, you can see, um, you know, her. She has some degenerative disc disease, uh, mainly, you know, obviously you can see that C5, C6, as well as C6 and 7. Um, you can see sclerosis of her end plates. Um, she has uh, formation of some osteophytes, and then she also has narrowing of her disc spaces. Um, in this patient, an MRI was obtained. Similarly, um, you know, you have, you can see evidence of degenerative disc disease, narrowing of those disc spaces, as well as some posterior disc bulges um, at multiple levels. Um, so her worst level uh, would probably be C6, 7. Um, she has uh, the worst degeneration at that level, um, but she also has adjacent segment pathology, mainly some disc osteophyte complexes above. Um, at C4, C5, uh, um, C4, C5, and C5, C6. So in this patient, you know, I, I discussed hybrid procedure. She ended up undergoing a hybrid procedure um, rather than just having a three-level anterior fusion. 
Um, the decision was made to fuse the worst segment at C67 and then um, uh, have a two level disc replacement option for C4, C5, and C5, C6. Um, and she also has been doing well postoperatively with um, almost complete resolution of symptoms. She still has some residual numbness, but um, she's been doing quite well. We have some residual symptoms. Yep. Num num numbness only gets better half the time. Yes. You said this should be done for radiculopathy and she had numbness and neck pain. Are you saying all of her neck pain went away? No, I mean, I, I'm saying in, in here, she had numbness and she had bilateral shoulder pains, shoulder pain that would then radiate into her upper extremities. So, you know, I think she has multi-level disease. So I think her, her pain was a little bit harder to describe from a dermal tunnel standpoint. I mean, she has disease at C4-5, C5-6, C6-7. Um, so, you know, if it radiates into bilateral upper extremities, you can kind of assume she's having radicular pain on both arms. Um, so you're saying this person has, has bilateral herniated discs and all the neuroforamens. Isn't it better to find out which... I'm not saying she's herniated discs. I'm saying she's degenerative disc disease and she's narrowing of her foramen because her disc height has become... She has, uh, you know, decreased had, but, Right, but you, you're... Op you're not describing, you're, you're basically treating all the levels considering all the nerve roots are being irritated. I understand mm -hmm. you have radiculopathy, but you're saying she has bilateral radiculopathy involving three different nerves on both sides. Yet she has no motor weakness and all she has is numbness. It just sounds odd. I mean, you're putting in this disc, which sounds like it's got great short-term results, but every other replacement that we've ever done in any other joint eventually will fail. Every joint does fail. So if it's not five years, it's 10 years, it's 15 years, going back seems like it's not the easiest thing in the world. It's not like a total hip. Or are you saying these never fail? I'm not saying these never fail and we don't have outcome data. I mean, obviously um, there are revision procedures, you know, the rates of uh, index operations on the same surgical level. And I think the 10 year mark was like, um, like 7%. So you know, that's not nothing. Um, but, you know, this patient, she hasn't been able to work due to her symptoms. It's clearly affecting her life. So, you know, do you just, she's tried a cons considerable conservative measures, you know, it's saying that your disease isn't that bad just because, you know, I know but you're, you're confusing two different things in the beginning. You told us not to do this procedure for, for pain. You said to do it for radiculopathy that doesn't get better. And you said to wait six weeks, although you said most radiculopathy gets better by six months. And sometimes if you wait a year or two, yep. it seems ridiculous. Yep. Right. It's uh, yeah. crazy. But, but at least, so you're saying in a young person, after six weeks now, if you have neck pain and unconfirmed level of radiculopathy, so you've just taken the indications and expanded it to almost anything. Okay, to go back to the original uh, FDA study, uh, the parameters that you put in it, Excluded rather for the original study was not to treat axial neck pain. Um, that was imposed by the FDA. That wasn't the, the choice necessarily of the investigators. Uh, once it was marketed, uh, I think the majority of us consider this a superior device exactly for that indication. Intractable axial neck pain with radiculitis, which is what this patient had. Uh, and I, I think she was a candidate to have something done. Uh, you cannot, uh, to, no, no insurance company will allow you to three levels because only two levels have been approved for this particular uh, implant. And so the choice for a micro procedure. Uh, was appropriate since uh, you had three level disease. Uh, don't count on that original contraindication as something set in stone because that was what was imposed in this. the ability to get this study done uh, by the FDA. And as far as longevity, I think at uh, the seven to 10 year mark, the longevity of this device and similar devices that have a uh, mobile segment in between the polyethylene that's similar to the longevity of total hips and total knees. And so I don't think it's unreasonable to expect them to have the same longevity. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, I know you're saying 
she has axial neck pain, but she, she does have ridiculous symptoms. She has pain radiating to both of her upper extremities. We so. have radiculitis. We have radiculopathy. It yep. takes a good deal of pressure yep. to get radiculopathy, and that's not something that you sit on for very long. So radiculitis, you can treat conservatively, but there are patients like this that reach a point where it's chronic and it interferes with normal function. And that's an indication for some sort of uh, Procedure. Rob, what is the revision procedure? So let's say 10 years later that this fails somehow. I, I think, you know, I'd say, I think most people 10 years later, if you're, what I've seen from most literature is there's not, there haven't been that many um, reports of putting in a new, arthro, new replacement. Um, most of the time at that point, you convert it to a fusion. Um, so um, I, I certainly it's been done for like, they, they report, you know, um, some of the studies report adverse events where the implant was malpositioned or the implant became extruded um, because it wasn't fixed properly with the implants. And those, they go back and they put in a new implant. Uh, but uh, for most of the ones that I've seen where there's a, a reoperation on the index segment, it's been converting into a fusion down the line. And you say at 10 years, the revision rate's about 7%? Yeah, so if I go back here, I mean, I have, there's, there's data on a lot of them. Brian actually just came out with, uh, the Brian disc replacement, which is that um, non-articulating disc, came out with 15-year data recently, um, but it's not based off their FDA IDE studies, and so I didn't include it because it's. Um, so this is seven-year data. So you know this is that cumulative level. So this is adjacent and index level. The Moby C, um, or so the Moby C is this is just the adjacent level. So this is 4.4 percent at the adjacent levels, and then. Um, this is the 10 year data. So um, surgery at the index level is 4.4% at seven years compared to 16.2% for an anterior fusion, which to me seems a little bit high for the fusion. I mean, I would think that majority of patients would have a pretty good fusion, but uh, I'm not I'm curious that the data doesn't support the uh, uh, general clinical experience of anterior this fusion, which is a very yeah, it's always considered uh, uh, your gold standard. standard. Yeah, yeah. great procedure. They always hold as well. Not quite, but I, uh, my experience. Is I think the mo. I will say I think the Moby C data. I, I chose that implant, but the and the rates of success for the anterior fusion group was a lot lower than the other studies. So like the anterior fusion group for most of the other ones was you know overall success rate was like you know six was like seventy four percent for this arthroplasty, sixty four percent for the anterior fusion. So it was much similar, um, but I think in this one, it's just a little bit different. When you say subsequent surgery, is that at the same level or? The so the level? index level, this is that, the, sorry, this is the, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. So the index level is at the same level of the replacement right. and the adjacent level was all oh, at adjacent yeah. levels. So above and below, that's separate from each other. When you say the overall success, 79% versus 58, and I know you did two year and five year, which had similar numbers, actually worse numbers. What yep. does that mean overall success? I mean- So like I said, it has to do with the, it has outcome scores. So um, whether or not there's, there's improvements in their neck disability index scores as well. I think most studies also use the uh, short form or the VAS neck pain and VAS arm pain. It also has to do with the rates of reoperation, make sure it's not, um, significantly higher or lower than an anterior fusion, um, rates of neurologic improvement or neurologic compromise, and then I wrote it down here. And then um, lack of complications. So serious adverse events couldn't be any significantly higher or lower. So that those composite indexes led to a rate an overall success rate. So when we do total hips and total knees, is that the similar success rate? I mean, I mean, it just seems so low for both. I mean, especially thirty-seven percent success rate. Who, who for, I know, yeah. For I, that's like I said, I was surprised about that number as well. But even uh, sixty-nine, who's do, who, who would do operations that the success rate is so low? Something just seems odd. They, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. So I mean, I think some of the problems are you have patients who. You know, have this surgery and don't have significant relief in their whether it's their scores or you know they end up uh, having a reoperation for adjacent segment disease. You know, I think 
it's it's kind of it's a hard thing to say like we're going to do both levels versus we're doing a single level and so or we're doing uh, two levels versus you know and not going to do that third or fourth level because we want to make sure that you're part of the study it's, i don't it, you know it's not laid out clearly in in all the studies they're obviously you know designed um to show at least non-inferiority if not superiority and i think you know uh it, you know that's that's kind of the, the purpose of them is to try to get the, the device approved by the FDA, and I think they've been able to do that very well. But thought so I thought your talk was great. Um, I thought you delivered it well. You know, I think these cases are very controversial, and you know, five surgeons in the room are probably going to have five different opinions how to treat uh, some of these problems. Um, but you gave us a very nice overview of of disc replacement. Uh, my question is, is just in terms of the actual cost of these implants, and I take this back, you know, 15, 20 years, you know, it used to be an iliac crest bone graft that we would take and we wouldn't use any additional plating or caging. And now, you know, it seems like industry has really taken over this space. Um, what, what's the actual cost that the hospital pays for a cervical disc replacement? I know that you're talking qualities and, you know, that gets very nebulous as you go out with time, but what's the actual hit to the system, you know, on the day of surgery for something like this? I'm honestly, I mean, I have to defer to Dr. Malberg who's here. I think he's the only client. I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure what they cost. I'm sure it's the, not cheap. You know, <laughs> the implant cost, is that what you're asking? The actual cost of the implant itself? Yeah. Uh, Last figure I was quoted was somewhere around thirty-two or thirty-three thousand dollars. And then, I mean, compared to that, to a cage for an anterior disc fusion is uh, what? The, uh, you know, going back, as I mentioned, uh, in ancient times, we take a like press bone graft yeah. and jam it in there and hope for the best. Uh, certainly, don't advocate going back to that. My what the cost of basis is. Yes, the success rate of that was not terribly high. Uh, and so adding implants uh, makes things a lot better. But if you look at the cost of the devices, the uh, plates are not nearly as costly and they're cervical plates and you can use uh, allograph or autograph. Allograph is expensive as well. Uh, the low profile and yeah, your approach yeah. uh, which was used on that last hundred case uh, although they're less expensive uh, here, I can't give you a, a figure on that, uh, but they're not that much less expensive than the disc replacement. Those that are uh, devices that have a good deal of engineering that they're trying to make up for, several components, and they include uh, you know, high grade peak, uh, which is no longer cheap. Did I answer your question, Dr. Cott? Great. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just another example of how industry has really crept into, into the space for somewhat of a nebulous diagnosis. Yeah. I know Robert, I have a question. Yep. Go ahead, Dr. Swan. Thanks. Um, nice presentation. Uh, so what would you say the board answer is for a straightforward single level um, case of radiculopathy that's failed non-op measures? I mean, I think the board answer probably right now in the U.S. would probably still be a, a fusion, but I, I think, you know, if you had, I don't think they'd give you, or I don't think they should give you a, a question with an option for a disc replacement versus a fusion. Um, but I mean, based off of what, like my grand rounds and what I've been thinking, I would probably say it should be a disc replacement. I think you have better long-term outcomes for a single level. Um, and, you know, yeah, there's still the overhead question you know, 20 years, 25 years down the line to be still last. Um, but, you know, I think, uh, I, I think it's, it's been shown in the short term to have, you know, a better success rate than a fusion. So I would probably say, I, I would want to say this replacement, but I, I haven't taken the board yet. So I don't know. I don't think they, that the board would question it that way. They would more likely try to find out what you know about it and ask you which has uh, this replacement versus fusion at one level, uh, are the outcomes similar or which has the uh, 
better cost analysis, which has a lower complication rate, which has a lower reoperation rate. I don't think they come out and say you yeah. have a choice, but they would kind of lead you down that path with a couple of questions. And I agree that the you know, given what we learned, that the single level fusion for the patients that can for either uh, for either one, and you know, right now the public just replacement security. Was the rehab very different? Because I was saying, I know an orthopedic surgeon who had an ACDF on Friday and was back seeing patients on Monday in the office. I don't think and so. I mean, it's, so, a, it's the same surgical approach. Um, it's, it's actually, I uh, find this a little easier approach than ACDF. Yeah. It, uh, exposure is less. It's at the very least comparable, and uh, it's, you know, it's the same day procedure. I'm uncomfortable doing right. any days of neck procedure in an outpatient setting, but for those who are comfortable, it certainly can be done. It's the same yeah. day procedure. Uh, and uh, getting back to work after the weekend is the more a function of the uh, mentality of an orthopedic surgeon versus someone who is uh, more normal. Um, the patient return functions very quickly. They're just restricted from a strenuous activity. Yeah, heavy lifting, I think, actually does it like for like six months, things like that, uh, for a period of six to 12 weeks. And that's an individual thing. But getting back to a clerical position, sure, it's, it's, uh, it's equal. All right. Well, thank you very much.